Right. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the reminder, Martin. Um, I would have forgotten. So, um, again, welcome to the Alto um, Working Group uh, meeting here in a virtual uh, interim meeting. Um, and as I was saying, this is nothing new for us. We've done virtual interims before. Um, also with Cisco WebEx, and we, uh, we're a little uh, behind schedule now because it took us some time to get the screen sharing working, but everything is working. So welcome, next slide, BJ. Next slide, please. Yes, so this is the note. Well, um, I think I don't have to say much about this. Um, this these are the um, general ITF rules, and these also apply for virtual interim meetings. So you are all um, um, obliged to 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 um, note any IPR you might know related to, to to work we discuss here. Everything is public. Everything um, is uh, you know available in the public domain and so forth. And um, Vijay, I cannot see the slides anymore. Something changed. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what happened. Um, all right, let me share it again. Okay, thank okay. you. So, um, yeah, I think everybody's familiar with this, but um, just uh, to, to so that you know this, uh, the, the ITF rules apply. Um, um, also, please look in the chat. Martin uh, already, um, who is our new AD, also. Um, and posted a link for the blue sheets. So we're having virtual blue sheets. So please sign the blue sheets here. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, what's our status? Not from a general perspective, uh, not much. We made some progress, but the general status is the same as in the last meetings. We are focusing on finishing the charter items, so the working group items. And for those, we have uh, uh, set up the agenda. So we are going to discuss those first. And we want to finish the milestones as soon as possible, and we are getting there. Um, so we will discuss it in, in a minute. And um, yeah, thanks to our new AD Martin for um, updating the milestones. Uh, so the deadlines of the milestones they were a little bit outdated, and um, so we updated them. Um, you can have a look at the on the website. Next slide. So, as I was saying, the agenda has been set up that we discuss the charter or working group items first. Um, and then we have a little bit uh, time left for other new interesting work, um, which is not covered by the current charter. Um, any comments on the agenda? Any questions? Any Anyone want to change the agenda? I guess that's... Not the case. Oh yeah, I see on the chat. Uh, Martin is asking about taking minutes. We should have uh, note takers. So um, uh, Richard said he could take notes. And while yep. presenting, um, uh, yeah, I have to pronounce the name right. Kiao is. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm the second note taker. Kiao would be second note taker uh, while Richard is presenting. And also Sabine said she would take notes. Uh, Miss Sabine on the call. I do not see her. Um, so yeah, we have note takers, but thanks Martin for asking. Um, I don't see Sabine on the call though, I have to check. Who, you mean Sabine? Yeah. Uh, let me check. She's not on the call so far. Yeah. So, but we have one, we have, so we have one note taker for now and I, I, I hope she will join soon. Okay. Um, maybe somebody can send her an email in the back uh, in the meantime. Send her. Um, okay, next slide please. Um, yeah, so what's our progress? So the last meeting was in Singapore in November. We had uh, two um, interim chairs there because Vijay and I both couldn't make it. So thanks again um, for that. Um, our general status is we made some progress. So we have a new RFC, RFC 686, which is the uh, cross domain server discovery document that finally made it. We have two documents finally in the RFC editor queue, which are cost calendar and SSE. So they are, you know, out of our hands, so to speak. And I think it's just uh, editing now and they will be soon published at RFC as RFCs. And uh, we have the Alto CDNI request routing document that has passed a working group last call. Um, so we have a presentation on this document and we can discuss further, but I think this is uh, pretty much done because it passed the working group last call and it also got feedback from the CDNI working group. So one of the individual reviewers doing this working group last call was from CDNI. And 
we, as I'm a co-author of this, so speaking as author, also we have addressed all the comments. Um, but we can discuss after Jensen presents uh, this document. So basically, uh, this document. So basically, we have three remaining milestones: path vector, performance metrics, and unified properties. And. Um, it's a benefit of working at home, huh? Please <laughs> mute yourself if you're not talking. So as I was saying, so we have three remaining milestones. They are um, path factor performance metrics, unified properties. You can see it on the slide. Each of them is very mature. For each of them, we have a new version, and for each of them, we have a presentation today. So this is our main focus, discussing these documents uh, in, in, in detail today. What's missing to get it out of the working group? Are there uh, major issues? Are there minor issues? What's the status? Um, so that's our focus. Um, next slide, please. So this is for everybody's information. We uh, we have an interesting SICOM workshop this year, um, which is very related to what we're doing in Alto. Of course, SICOM is a research conference, but I know a lot of people, the people here uh, work also in research as well as in standardization. So there's a workshop on network application integration and co-design, the NAI workshop. Um, I, I took it here from the website. The scope is contributions to the design principles and real implementations of systems that enable network application co-design. So I think Alto is even specifically mentioned also in the uh, call for papers. Um, if you want to know more, you can, um, Richard can say something later on um, about it maybe, um, as he is a, a TPC chair, a co-TPC chair, and um, the, you, can, you can find the link here. And the submission deadline is very soon, April 30. So if you're interested, uh, please consider submitting to this conference because it's very related to our work here. Right. So, Young, can I just like give one minute? One yeah, minute. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Very quickly. Uh, so, uh, the deadline is April 30, six pages, and we're, I think we're also considering possibility of accepting a uh, two page uh, abstract. And it's going to be very interesting, really, really motivated by auto work. And uh, for example, we have uh, two very interesting keynotes, one by Albert Greenberg, who is from Microsoft Azure team, and Bruce Max from used to be Akamai and now at Duke. So, we have a uh, Quite, quite interesting, highly, highly related workshop. So we really encourage people to uh, submit to this conference, uh, to this workshop. And very likely, by the way, if you worry about traveling, most likely SICOM even though is on August 14th in New York City, but most likely it will be virtual, so therefore might be make attending easier. Okay, back to you, Jan. Sorry about that. No, no problem. No, thank, thanks. Those were actually good, good points. Um, so yeah, please keep this in mind. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, this is what we and I prepared. Um, we also want to uh, um, uh, thank Martin, our area director. We had a chat with him also in preparation where we discussed the status of the working group. Um, remember, we really want to wrap up all existing working work group items um, as soon as possible. That's our focus, and any new work will be you know a secondary thought for us right now. Of course, we allocated uh, agenda time to this if if there's space, but um, we want really want to focus on the. Uh, charter items. Any other business? Any anybody has a uh, something I forgot or we forgot or wants to mention something? All right. Uh, please sign the blue sheets. Martin has put out a URL on the chat, so please make sure you sign those. Okay. If there is no if there are no other comments, I'm also looking at the chat here. Um, yeah, can we, uh, should we talk about the cube mechanics? Say again, cube mechanics. So, um, if you want to ask a question or comment on a presentation in the chat, sure. put a plus Q. If you want to leave the chat, put a minus Q or Q minus doesn't really matter what. And that's how we can kind of maintain a line. If you wish to comment. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I wasn't, uh. Um, that's that's uh, um, that's very good information. I, I don't think we did it in the past, but for sure that's good. Let's well, do that's, this. Yeah, right. I think that, 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 that's, yes. that's the norm you've been using for 107 meetings. Um, the volume is a little higher than usual. Yeah, no, uh, good. So, 
I'm going to be monitoring the um, the chat. So if anybody has any question and want to queue up to the virtual mic, just indicate with a plus Q, and I'll try to keep track of who was there first. Okay. All right. Um, given that this is obviously the speaker cannot see um, the the queue, so if I feel the question is urgent, I'll interrupt the speaker. Um, you know, if um, if you can indicate whether you want to interrupt the speaker, that might help me. Otherwise, um, we can take the questions at the end of the session. If the speaker is also looking at the chat session and um, you know wants to wants to say something, so I guess we'll feel it out as we go along. But um, let's continue. All right, I'm going to queue up uh, CDNI. That's the uh, next one. Mm -hmm. I see Jensen, so he's ready to go, I think. Jensen, the floor is yours. I think it doesn't have a microphone. Jensen? Uh, from what I see, it doesn't look like with a microphone, so. He can use my microphone. We are in the same apartment. Let me grab him just one second. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay. Sorry. Maybe my microphone has any issues. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, uh, today I just uh, should go over the update from the uh, last uh, ITF meeting. What's uh, what's the uh, changes and uh, it's about the CDI document, the next test. Yeah. And uh, so after the last item meeting, we, we have uh, put the, the document to the working last call and uh, received some comments from the auto and the CDI working group. So we have some, we have three revisions uh, iterated after that and addressed all the comments and the major comments. We, uh, we put the wording and fix some minutes and uh, you know, so update the examples to fix some grammar issues in the example and uh, update the settings and we clean up the, the background section and the security considerations. So uh, you can see the, the document is already uh, the design is already stable and uh, we already fixed some uh, minor issues. The remaining issues uh, actually it's it, it because it depends on the unified properties and uh, we should have some updates uh, after the invite properties get stable. So I will talk about the so for for, for the major update uh, for for the uh, details of the updates you can you can uh, look at the the document. But, uh, the next step I will quickly uh, show some updates on the examples and uh, the there many issues on the invite property part. The next one. Okay, so in the new examples, we so this example should they actually should the the server want to change the delivery protocols of the first FCI advertisement object from the HTTP HTTP one point one to the HTTPS one point one, and uh, the previous example is wrong because we try to use the JSON merge patch, but uh, the previous uh. The FCI resource, the response, uh, includes uh, multiple objects. So the remaining objects will be removed if you use the this merge path. So update the example to use the full replacement each class. So uh, let's update uh, the first update and the next one. So another update is uh, shown in the incremental update. Uh, Example for the FCI uh, resource yielding the auto P, uh, PID footprint. And in this example, 
uh, because the uh, FCI results uh, depend on the network map. So the network map may, may also change. So we change the example to superpose the FCI results and the dependent to the network map results. So if the network map uh, updated, so the the service can can update and send the uh, updated dependent network map uh, for the FCI resource. Okay. So next slide. So that's the remaining issues because the second six of the uh, current uh, FCI document use the property map to provide the mapping uh, from the footprint to the CFC grid. So, but the, the property map related the IANA registry is not uh, uh, stable now. So we, we have some discussion, maybe Sabine, after that, the screen will give some updates about the discussion and how to update the, this part about the planning. And the uh, major part is that the the entity property type CDFC capabilities is a resource specific and uh, it can only be associated, uh, associated with the CDFC resource. So we should mention uh, this information somewhere in the document, but uh, uh, what about the how to update this part? It depends on the update of the entire property document and uh, also the property map also be used to carry the CNAFC accuracy property of the PID entities that it used. So we should mention that the, the associated resource of the PID domain must be a dependent network map instead of the CNAFC resource. So that should be added in the next uh, revision of the document. Okay, so next one. Okay, so the planning of the uh, FCA document is that we are trying to update the property map related part after the N5 property document is stabilized. And then we can discuss how to move to the next stage. Good question. So is um is the idea to move um, CDNI and um, unified properties together? There is a dependency. So, uh, uh, okay, maybe if I may, I may comment, is that okay? Oh, you, you're with Jensen. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, I, I think actually that would be a question to the working group. And uh, FCI by itself is really, really independent. And, but given that, uh, we want to demonstrate that uh, the, you know, this uh, yeah, will really become a unified property, so therefore introduce this dependency. Uh, but that's probably too much a dramatic change. And I think we discussed yesterday. And one possibility, of course, is we don't even depend on unified properties. We just remove that part, but that's probably a large cut. Then if we don't do this large cut, and then we potentially have to really wait until unified property fully stabilized, because otherwise I don't believe CDNI itself can really move, move on because there's a big part where there's a section depending on example. Okay, so that's not a problem. Um, I mean, if it depends on unified properties, then it depends on unified properties. There's a number of drafts that depend on each other and move together as a group. So um, I don't think we need to lobotomize um, CDNI if it depends on uh, unified properties. We just move them together. It's just a process question. Okay, gotcha. So I'll take a note. So the, 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 I guess the, the, the guidance from you is uh, let's really still keep the dependency, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll just move those together if they are dependent on, on um, if CDNI is dependent on, on unified properties. So it's more a process question. I don't think we need to add any work to our queue to take out dependency in CDNI. Um, that's just more work. We'll just move these together. Yeah, well, I, I would like to clarify. So when we say there's dependency, does this mean that the like the actual test of one is going to change based on the other, or just that there's a normative reference that really need to come together and not in the editor queue? Uh, okay, do I do I answer or I waiting on the queue? Oh, maybe Jensen can answer. Oh, Sabine. Okay. Oh, well, my short answer is following. Uh, 
uh, it's, a, it's more than a reference. And uh, really, there's a section talking about how to use the uh, unified properties, even in the text. So, therefore, if, for example, suppose the unified property uh, changes some text, some syntax, some way to register, and then the FCI need to change as well. So, therefore, there's slightly stronger copy than just like a normal reference. Or even in, in what well, is a modern uh, normative reference, it's even like a text. Okay, um, I think uh, Vijay, just quickly, so just to clarify, I'm also I'm speaking now as chair, but I'm also a co author of this document. So, I think what Richard is saying is that uh, we have a, a like a classic dependency where we want to publish these RFCs together. So, what you said was pretty much um, the way we should go do this. We should. Uh, you know, publish wait wait the unified properties is done, and then we can publish them together. Because then, during the pub publication, you can directly put the correct RFC number in the CDNI. You can refer to unified properties with the correct um, RFC number, right? All right. Well, I mean, that's going to be taken care of in the editor queue if there's a if there's a um, normative reference like we. If, if the only issue is that there's a normative reference and we're getting RFC numbers right, then we can submit everything up to up to the IESG, and it's all going it's all going to correct itself. But if we actually have to change the underlying, if, if the actual text has to change based on how UP um, evolves, then we have to hold this in the working group until until all these design details are worked out. Yeah, I, I understand the difference. Um, so, but I'm not sure how to answer. Maybe Richard, you can answer it. Yet. But Richard's answer was clear. It, it, we think we need more text changes also in CDNI as unified properties is evolving to the uh, short, short answer is there's a risk of text change. Yeah. yeah. So, may or may not, and depends on how dramatically, how drastically we make the changes in unified properties. If we don't, it's very, very likely, but there's a chance there is text changes beyond only the reference numbers. So. I would probably have to my of course that's my personal suggestion is we probably wait a little bit and uh, hopefully not too long because the unified property coming up <laughs> yeah I, I think we need to move ahead because of time um i think there's a good reason to believe that we need to move these together there might be some issues um for the note takers there might be some issues on more than just an rfc number dependency but we can sort those out on the list but for right now, it seems that we want to move these together. Okay. So Sabine, um, I know we are running late. So all the people that are coming now, if you could, um, um, you know, um, hew to the time, that'll be awesome. Sabine, I see you're online, so please go ahead. Sabine? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so uh, I said I will try to rush uh, the presentation. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So yeah, uh, in a nutshell, uh, for those not so familiar, so as you could hear, uh, unified property is quite a uh, important piece uh, in this uh, working group. So, in a nutshell, this extends IPv4 and IPv6 endpoints to entities such as IPv4 and 6 entities, but also PIDs and abstracted network elements as uh, described in the path vector draft. And on these entities, uh, properties are conveyed. Uh, the unified properties also introduces a new information resource and media type which is a property map uh, on entities, filter or not. Uh, it is used, as you see, by several Alto services. It can be used as a standalone uh, service on, for endpoint entity properties. It is also a part of the multi-path path vector cost map server response that conveys properties on the ANEs that are returned. It is also used by CDNI, FCI, uh, as you just saw. So the entity, one thing is the entity property service handles information resource dependent entities and properties. 
meaning uh, the ID and values of entities and property depend on given information resources. This requires a careful design for resource dependent entities and properties. This requires an unambiguous mapping of properties to applicable entities. This also requires an unambiguous mapping of entities, properties to applicable information resource, uh, meaning you can't uh, query any entity or any property uh, for uh, any resource. So for these reasons, uh, this work has been a long lasting uh, design and specification exercise. But uh, we are uh, <laughs> we are progressively approaching to uh, the convergence. So next slide, please. So uh, the current version that you can see on the status pages is version number eleven that was submitted in March. So in this version, um, so the basically the, the the changes that are on this version will be also revised and enriched. So I won't spend much time on the changes on version 11, but uh, rather focus on version that are ongoing, um, the, the version 12 in preparation uh, that is in progress and will be submitted uh, as soon as possible. So in version 11, you have changes to simplify and clarify. So actually the non-normative text is of key importance because it introduces so many new concepts. So um, there has been a huge addition work to clarify uh, the terminology uh, in these sections. So in version 11, there was already, uh, an, um, so that started already in version 11 on section 1, 2, 3 that are non-normative. Uh, uh, in section 6, 5, um, some text was added on inheritance rules uh, on, for properties uh, in the IPv4 and 6 entity domain. In, there, there is a section 6 that was um, trying to explain from which entity actually you can get given entity domains and given properties. And this will be uh, uh, heavily revised as well. And in version 11, you have a new text uh, relating to uh, draft IETF auto path vector. As you know, this works uh, with as a bundle uh, with unified properties. So, um, in so uh, basically, the text is about uh, introducing an example and see how it works in the IRD and in um, how properties are conveyed. Uh, within a multi-part responses of, uh, for path vector cost. So there is no changes in the design and uh, further explanation and cleanup and clarification are needed before this draft is submitted for working group last call. So uh, I will go now on the new revision uh, that is in progress. Next slide. Uh, so, um, what is done uh, what is uh, done in this uh, new version in progress is further explanation on section 2 and section 3 that introduce entity domains entity properties and also uh, resource dependent entity domain and resource entity properties because that seems quite complex but we need to do this because uh, uh, the resource, the information resource dependency that we uh, need to um, take care of. So, uh, in section uh, six, uh, well, as uh, section six was about uh, how, uh, what entities and, and domain uh, and properties you can request from which resource. Uh, section five, four, five, eight, nine are normative and they will be further clarified and harmonized. Section ten. Uh, on path related to path vector, we'll have more generic text uh, for the example. And uh, section 12 on IANA also needs a uh, revision. So next slide, please. 
so by the way, how much time do I have left? Not much. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, in version 12, so typically, so I'll just take a bunch of example. Um, Sabine, you have uh, about six minutes left. Uh, okay, so that's fine. Okay, typically uh, in in these non-normative sections that introduce the concepts, we ended up with a clear uh, definition of what is an entity domain type, which is generic and goes to IANA registration, and what is an entity domain name, which is defined in the auto server scope, and has to um, has to be different uh, from the type when the entity domain uh, depends on a given information resource. Uh, this is pretty clear now and the rest of the text uh, should follow and be much uh, easier to understand and read. Uh, so uh, same for the entity property type, which is generic and goes to IANA and entity domain, uh, entity property name, which has to be different because for a given property type, like PID, for example, uh, this, uh, the, the value of this property depends on the information resource on which this property was defined. And it also uh, depends on the information resource in which the entity on which you uh, query this property has been, has been defined. So next slide, please. So uh, in the section three, there has been further addition. So with a text, a clarifying text, uh, explaining why uh, why this design seems so uh, complex, actually. And so um, so there has been text saying that uh, in uh, an entity must be owned by exactly one entity domain name. And an entity identifier must point exactly to one entity. So this explains all the uh, resource-dependent design of entity domain names and property names. Um, so on resource-specific entity domain name, there are further explanation and illustration. And uh, especially when an entity is defined with respect to an information resource. So the, the and explain how this uh, entity domain name must associate it, associate the relative resource ID and entity domain type. And we're given an example for network map two, uh, for example, a PID that is only exists within a network map, a given network map. And if you take the same name for a PID in another uh, network map, it can I uh, it can point to a completely different set of endpoints. So next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so this is also a summary of the updates uh, on resource specific entity properties, uh, and we explain that actually we take the same approach as uh, in the base protocol where the property name is associated with the, inform, uh, with the ID of the relative information resource. So in the base protocol, you define, for example, the PID property that you query on an endpoint address. You associate the name of this property to the name of the information resource where it was defined. So, and there is also, uh, uh, updates that are being done on uh, on that key feature uh, that well this is the the this section explains that a client needs to know what property it can query <clears throat> on a given entity domain and this section points to the sections that are documenting the authorized combination. For example, you can query uh, you can uh, query a property on an endpoint uh, an 
IPv4 entity that is defined in a network map. You can so you can associate network map and entity domain uh, IPv4, but you cannot associate network map with entity domain INE because it doesn't make sense, and the client needs to know this so that, for example, uh, if a server uh, exposes irrelevant uh, combinations such as network map uh, and A and E, the client uh, is able to to know that it just should ignore this. So there is no complicated error handling, but all the authorized associations between information resource and entity on one side and information resource on property on the other side have to be documented in the document where these entity uh, domain types are defined and when this, where these property types are defined. So initially, we thought about making an IANA registry for that, but it's too I mean, complex. You have two minutes, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I'll be done. <laughs> and so, um, in the, so we decided that it has to be documented along with the text that introduces these entity domain types and these entity domain names. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, about the also the entity hierarchy and property in your inheritance rules that applies in some cases where entity domains can be uh, assimilated to a set and defined by the identifier in the, of these sets. This is the case for address blocks. And instead of defining an individual entity properties, you just define a property on this set. And if these sets obey some strict rules of order relation or inclusion, you can even uh, define some inheritance rules and you this allows you to obtain substantial savings in payload. So I will not go over the the rest, but so we can go to the next slide. So this is this is what these updates are were really fundamental because this explains the rest of the design. So I we can skip uh, the other uh, slide, uh, maybe the next slide. So yeah, uh, the, the 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 other uh, important change will be about the IANA consideration, and so we will add a new information item t telling, explaining why we need to uh, the the client sh has to be cognizant uh, of the authorized association between information resources and entities and properties, and also we ha will add a new entry for the pro and, uh, property type registry. And in the next slide, I think this is this will be the end. So thank you. So we have time for a quick question. If anybody has, um, also please do sign the blue sheets. Um, there is the link to the Etherpad on the chat. Only um, nine of twenty-five people have signed up right now. Questions on Sabine's presentation? So speaking as chair, I think uh, given Sabine's summary of um, the impacts to um, to the previous draft, um, I think it seems reasonable to move these together as a group. Um, I think there's enough dependencies outside of just an RFC number. At least that's what I think right now. Um, <clears throat> Right. If there is no other questions, then I will invite um, the authors of performance metric to please queue up while I put the slide on. Yep. So, BDM here. I'll, I'll present, and Louis will help. Perfect. Okay. Floor is yours. Yep. Okay. And I will talk about auto performance metrics. And uh, so you can see that here I'm talking about version 10, which has not been uh, updated and uploaded. The old version, uh, IETF 106, was uh, version 8. 
and then right by the IETF deadline, which is March 20 something and upload version nine. And in the meantime, we also made a bunch of changes, made several changes in version 10, but we felt that it's not a bad idea to upload uh, a new version three or four. I'm talking <laughs> about like, upload it as soon as possible and maybe right after the video. <laughs> maybe someone should mute. Okay. And so here, the outline of my talk is I'm going to uh, essentially give the major updates from version 8 to version 10. And the main thing really is systematic refinement of acquisition context, or someone we call uh, cost context. And then we'll give a little bit details and refine the details according to the individual performance metrics. And then we did a lot of general text edit, which I will not, I'll not go to detail, I will not go to details. And then we do have one or two remaining issues which we want to be discussed. We feel that we're mostly ready, and but we do want to have uh, get last one more round of feedback from the working group. Next slide, please. The main change is about acquisition context. And to really for people who are not familiar with what it is, and that was a major, major uh, milestone in terms of really make the document ready and was basically this, I think that's IETF 105, I forgot. And uh, so major decision with people from uh, auto working group, IPPM and so on is auto provide guidance and not a measurement framework. That's really helpful. Even when we're talking about performance metrics and it's not a measurement framework. And also the major insight last time was auto provides multiple types of guidance. If you look at over here, and you can see things, for example, like observed values, that's the central measurement results. You can see things like a target value in the middle and lower uh, of, the, uh, of the screen. That's a really committed value or SLA. And if you look at the uh, lower part, you can see highlighted monthly uh, uh, network average, which means the guidance can be somehow, for example, uh, using, for example, like weekly or monthly data. So therefore there's a lot of diversity inside the system. We should capture them. Next slide, please. So really capture this one, and, and I think the major success, or at least to me, I'm pretty happy so far now, is we really define something called, uh, essentially called cost context. Or I think Sabine wants to eventually change it to maybe acquisition context, because uh, there's a separate uh, draft, which is also in an auto working group, uh, uh, has some concept called cost context. So therefore, there's a conflict. We'll find another name either called acquisition context, or so far in the document, in version 10, and it's called cost context. So what's cost contact? Essentially to give guidance, remember. Guidance, different types of guidance, details of guidance, how do we really provide the guidance? And essentially use cost contact. Cost contact has two members. One is source, cost source, one is parameters. The source essentially is a very simple high level value and talk about the type. And the parameters is to give low level details, which is uh, optional. If you look at over here, uh, lower left uh, your screen and the cost contact itself is essentially uh, optional. And then on the right hand side, you can see that there are two uh, members and the parameters really is essential. We, we think that's really a best compromise to so give the details. At the same time, you don't really like, slow down the progress and give flexibility uh, for different deployment settings. Next slide, please. Okay. And so basically, and eventually is we finalize with discussion with Luis, with all the people, we finalize four types of core sources. And they are, if you look at the text in version 10, nominal, SLA, and import, and estimation. And we made very clear that it's the operator of auto server who chooses the category because which, which guidance you're providing and operator makes a decision, we're not going to enforce it. And we do see that if you don't specify what it is and the four categories, application must assume it's estimation because that's probably the most generic, most big one. And, uh, and, uh, and the contents that would not be used as a key. So basically still it's performance and uh, cost metric and mode to add, serve as a key. So therefore, if you really have a multiple metric, for example, latency and uh, uh, in, the same, uh, in the same resource, then you're gonna have a problem. So therefore, for that case, you must separate it into different uh, information resources in your information directory. So therefore, we, we have no ambiguity issue. Next slide, please. So here essentially is we add a text to really give, give description and about four types of core sources, nominal, basically is static computation value, if you read very quickly, 
SLA and essentially is derived from commitment, which document refers to as service level agreement. But we do uh, uh, mention in, in text that uh, people use other terms, for example, target, committed, we see from all the other ones and so on. And here we do also give a little bit hint about A4 SLA, maybe recommended that parameters should give a link to the SLA definition. And import, and why import? I think this one really raised by Luis and several other people and import by Luis is for example, what if I know explicitly my guidance is derived from my 8571 PGPLS? Then it should be import, make it clear. So whenever possible, we want to give the option for people to give the specific information, same time a lot of people to be uh, a high level abstract away. So therefore, if it import and recommendation is for the parameters, please give the details of which systems you derive the raw data. Explanation is the most generic version. Essentially, it's just uh, the guidance that I computed from my protocols, from my measurement data, but I don't want to really uh, give you all the details because that's the way I compute it privately. It's really out of scope because this is not the purpose of auto. So therefore, estimation will clarify a little bit. Next slide, please. So given this one, and now we feel very happy now because if you look at the left-hand side, and it's a definition for every performance metric, and we for used to be version eight, we really have to struggle to talk about okay, what's the what are the measurement consideration? How do we do the measurement? I think that's so complex, so diverse, so many parameters. And now we've simplified to the right hand side, which is cost context specification considerations. So we essentially give the guidance about if it's a nominal, what you should specify, and if it's SLA, what you should specify. If you import, we give a couple of examples and where you can specify where you important imported your number, but it's really, really uh, performatic specific, for example, and for a throughput, and you can talk about there's nominal value for latency, you probably don't. Estimation, we give a little bit details to talk about how you really compute it and so on. So of course, this one is down for every single performance metric. We're pretty happy about that. Next slide, please. So given this one, of course, we have a lot of other small changes. For example, USB structure, uh, metric name, and so on. I think the suggestion from the review was please follow RFC 72, uh, 7285 format. So therefore, we change from metric name, we call identifier, and uh, we have the uh, Descriptions, now we change to value representation and we give the details about them and so on. And then of course we did a adjustment of normative references. And for example, we really want to give a reference about where each proper metric might come from. There are quite a lot of sources here from ITF and quite a different documents define different metrics. Uh, we give essentially uh, potential where they come from. Now they are no longer really normative, they become informative. informative. So therefore we simplify the, our uh, reference structure a little bit. Next slide, please. So basically, is uh, only remaining issue is how much detail do we give in terms of guidance on specifying the parameters and for different categories. And the current recommendation is typically for nominal is no, except probably for throughput is give the configuration parameter. And SLA and recommendation is please give a link to where this SLA is specified. For import, please specify which protocol you really imply. And for example, BGPLS or IPPM and so on. And estimation is, if possible, give a link. A link will give a description of tag where you describe. And this one will be essentially outside of scope. They're optional, but they're most informative. But we do want to talk, uh, get a guidance about how much, uh, which information we want to uh, specify for each category. Next slide, please. And uh, the other one, of course, the naming, but we don't want to change, but we did got one review and said, that we, do you want to be consistent with other people's name? For example, we call one way delay. Every single thing here is, most, is a one way. And, but RFC 8571 calls it unit directional, for example, delay, unit directional packet loss and so on. We did not really do that. So therefore our question is, we want to keep a current name that's short, simple. Uh, unit directional sounds, looks pretty long, but we do want to get feedback from group. And second question number two is uh, essential. I believe that's a really nice uh, review from a uh, you know, very early review, I believe, from Martin. And is, for example, should we focus on have a very stable set uh, uh, metrics? For example, minimal latency, which oftentimes ca can be stable and so on. And our latency, for example, uh, yeah, latency minimal basically is propagation delay. And uh, packet loss, probably mostly because not really like a tuning delay. 
typical minimal delay most likely coming from, for example, essential fiber or come from, for example, some like a software failures and so on. They're stable. So therefore, essentially, so one way to do is how to handle these type of things. And one way is we introduce more metrics. We call the metric the mean and the max and the percentile and so on to make it stable. And another one is uh, we introduce system, systematic model approach and essentially we have the metric and you really specify what statistics it is therefore to make it more stable. For example, if you take a mean, basically you remove away uh, the queuing delay most likely because queuing delay typically doesn't happen when you have a mean. And so therefore, right now, if we go down this path, we basically take the one-way delay and we add one-way delay dash mean and one-way, uh, for example, uh, loss and mean and so on. So therefore, to make it slightly more stable, then we don't really make a structure change. But that's the uh, feedback we want to get from working group. And I believe that's all uh, I'm done. Mo we're, we feel like we're mostly ready and maybe the single lar largest change maybe is question two. And we might need to add one or two, uh, for example, delays and probably uh, what we'll say. Okay, I'm done. Questions, suggestions, please. Any feedback on this? Because we might need to move it ahead. Um, Martin, please go ahead. Thanks for incorporating my um, my feedback. Um, just to be clear, I, I would recommend min and max instead of something like one way delay, instead of trying to report a mean, which is uh, likely not very stable. Um, so, I don't think that's way too many. Um, I don't want to just have a million parameters. I think it's probably a mistake, but uh, that, that was the actual intent of my feedback. Although, if you choose to do it another way, I suppose that's okay. Do, is, do we expect RTT? Um, while I understand that in the real, real world, reverse paths are often different. Do we expect RTT to be different than, the one, than something other than twice the one way delay uh, in the context of the way we generate these metrics? Uh, okay, that's an excellent question. And uh, so if you look at all the numbers, one way delay, hop, uh, packet delay variation, and packet loss, everything throughput actually all one way. And you're right. So basically, one way we always think that, for example, people uh, should, if you want the other directions and reverse your, your query uh, endpoints, okay. and you switch the source destination, and you will get uh, the the sum of delay. But the feedback I believe we got from uh, early review was is such a such a common uh, a query that you should really give RTT. For example, I think that the Question was uh, number one. By the way, would be answer question number one be why RTD can be different from one way delay is, uh, for example, source to destination. Maybe use a line, uh, line, line, and uh, and the, the reply might come from satellite. Can come from essentially asymmetry routing. I believe some data was talking about thirty percent of asymmetry. So therefore, and essential save run. So uh, question uh, answer number one is RTD can be essentially can be different from two times a one way delay of one direction, and it's really a sum. And there's thirty percent. I remember uh, from Arvind and many years ago, several years ago, was thirty percent. And the second one we introduced RTT was a optimization because oftentimes TCP throughput depends on. For example, if you really want SMTCP, TCP, essentially is proportional to RTT and instead of one way delay. So therefore, that's essentially shortcut. And, uh, so Richard, I think I I'm going to cut off the discussion here because we need to move ahead. Uh, I need an action item. So, Martin, what's your action? So, keep RTT or clarify why we have RTT? Um, I, I mean, it was actually, I mean, if I, I can see the case for it, I was just, I'm, I'm, I was tempted to try to prune this list as much as we can. And if, while RTT is often not twice the one way delay, if in fact <laughs> our measurement techniques and our SLAs and so on are not trying to make it quite different, then it might have been. It might have not been worthwhile to have both, but uh, I think it's fine to keep it in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, because otherwise- We don't need a ton of text about that either. I think it's fine. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, otherwise we want to. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. All right, um, Richard, if you could um, just push for this on the list and close any issues you have. I mean, your question too, I think having, you know, a metric dash stat seems reasonable. Um, lots of, um, you know, moments um, are captured in CSV files using using the same stuff. So if you could just, you know, push to finish these open questions, that'll be great on the list. Okay, got you. So basically summarize action item is uh, adopt ash, uh, because I really don't want to see, I want to see some kind of like structure as delay dash mean. Of course, I think probably 
I, uh, Martin, sorry, I really need to clarify. So are you suggesting and uh, um, instead of calling mean delay, call the one uh, propagation delay? Is that really right? Well, you have metric, um, your template here is metric um, dash stat. Yes. So to me, what that is implying is that you have a certain metric you're interested in and the stats are the moments of that metric. Right. So, you know, you might have metric dash min, metric dot max, metric dot mean, metric dot RTP, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so good. So I, I allow essentially this one to be defined systematically, basically right. Right. use a dash. Of course, probably only define a few, but uh, using some kind of umbrella template to design to define a, a few of them. Right, and I'm, I'm kind of going through that um, based on, if you look at lots of these data sets that are released for, you know, machine learning training purposes, now, many of their headers are similarly named, right? Metric dash mo dash moment of some sort. Um, so let's let's just go with that, unless somebody has specific objections to it. Great. Any objection? If not, I'm going because this is slightly larger change than the other stable change, so larger uh, in terms of content. Again, okay. we don't have to decide that here. We can take it to the list. Okay. okay. You like uh, like to move ahead. You don't mind. Cool. Huh? Then um, if there's no other questions, then I will queue up the next one, which is going to be um, path vector. So, Richard, it's you itself again. Oh, vector, uh, actually, you. it's me. Yep. Sorry, Richard. No problem. Let me queue it up. Okay. All thanks. Right. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, today uh, I'm Kai and today I'm going to present the progress on the pass vector draft. So as you, you may see that uh, we listed two versions of the draft. So the version 10 is already submitted to the uh, to the data tracker and uh, we also made some changes in the and to be published uh, after the, uh, the meeting. And next page please. So here is a summary of these two uh, submit, uh, submissions. So the most significant change is in the early sections, basically in the abstract introduction and motivation parts. And we want to revise the early parts to clarify that uh, basically two issues. The first issue is that the extension provides information, uh, basically to clarify what information we're trying to provide with this intention and also uh, according to some comments from the minutes that we want to uh, defend that this extension is not limited to a given application, but can be applied to multiple use cases. And we also have some minor uh, modifications according to some uh, issues raised uh, uh, in the early discussions. And uh, so here is a summary. And next, uh, next page, please. So the first issue uh, we want to clarify is the goal of extension and inversion. Oh, sorry, there's a spinning error. Uh, so in version nine, we use the term uh, past correlations as information conveyed in past vector, uh, which limits the scope of the extension and gives the wrong impression that extension is only for a specific type of applications. And starting from version 10, we actually uh, use the more general term of abstract intermediate network parts traversed by a path between a source and destination pair. And I think uh, we think this definition better clarifies, clarifies the scope of the extension and also makes the concept of AE more intuitive. And in version 11, we actually use component instead of parts. So uh, to be more consistent with the uh, terms. And next page, please. And the second issue uh, we fixed uh, it, uh, is the uh, motivation of the document. And in version 9, we use three use cases, but do not explicitly summarize requirements. So uh, a, lot, a, a lot of feedback says that uh, this makes, a, makes it difficult to grasp the main idea of this uh, motivation part. So in version 10, we, uh, according to the uh, suggestion of Sabine, we bring back the flow scheduling example, but, uh, but, but the current in the current document, the requirements are still too specific to the uh, to the uh, flow scheduling problem. So, in the next version, we are going to uh, use more general uh, additional requirements, which is derived from the flow scheduling example, but can be uh, but are more gener generic and can be applied to other applications. So, next page, please. 
and below are some uh, minor changes according to uh, to the uh, technical part of this document. And the first issue is to hand, handle cost constraint. And in the early versions, uh, mostly in version nine and version ten, we had a paragraph uh, saying that uh, how to handle uh, cost constraints in pass vector document. And as we noticed that a the same problem is raised to the main list on the cost calendar extension. So we make we also uh, make this explicit in the pass vector document, saying that uh, at least for the moment we do in the document we do not support a uh, constraint on the pass vector uh, response. And this is going to be included in the next revision. Uh, next page, please. And a uh, second issue is we start to change the name of any identifier to any name. And this is for two reasons. The first reason is any name actually conveys more information than any identifier. So when we use any identifier, it is most derived from, uh, because any is also an entity domain type. So any identifier is also the entity identifier of the any. And this uh, is more, gives, gives more hints that uh, any is an entity domain type. And uh, but also the meaning of the NE is, is an aggregation of, of network components. So it is actually very similar to the PID. So and uh, because PID uses PID name, and we think that any name uh, would give a better link to the actual meaning of the NE. And also in the text. Uh, so previously we are using uh, some, some explicit definitions of basically how the any identifier should be specified. And in the latest document, we actually refer to the, because any name must be com compatible uh, with the uh, entity ID. So we actually directly use the format of the entity identifier uh, de uh, defined in the unified property document. And uh, next page, please. So the next issue is also we change a. So we used to have a property called, uh, we used to have a field called any properties, which indicates the properties to be queried in the pass vector uh, re request, and we uh, we also change uh, we change the term to any property name because this uh, because property name is also uh, 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 consistent with the entity property name in the unified property document. So uh, next page, please. And and also we notice some uh, bug in the specification of the multi-part response. So previously we, uh, according to the uh, RFC, oh, sorry, I, I don't quite remember, remember the number, but according to the multi-part response document, it, there is a parameter called start, which indicates the first, uh, which indicates the root root object of the uh, multi multi part response but in in the specification of the two parts we actually use the first and the second which implies the order of the uh, part in the pass vector response so in the latest revision we actually uh, use pass vector part and the unified property map part to uh, refer to a different part. So they, the, the order of these two parts can be interchanged. Uh, and uh, the root, uh, and we also specify that the star parameter must uh, either be omitted, which indicates that the pass vector part is the first part in the multi-part uh, response. And also, uh, when it explicitly specified, it must point to the pass vector part. So next page, please. Uh, we also have fixed some uh, compatible issues with uh, the unified property document. So mostly, uh, for example, the uh, ANA registry for property uh, entity property types. And uh, previously, we have the prefix of ANE. And in the document of unified properties, this prefix has been removed. So we also removed this uh, prefix in the latest revision. So next page, please. Yep, uh, that's all for the update of Pass Vector. And for the next stops, I think as Pass Vector is moving along with Unified Property as a bundle, so uh, we, we are also uh, waiting for some final updates on the Unified Properties. And after that, we'll I think we can uh, talk.
talk about moving to the next stage. That's all. We have a minute. Questions? OK. Um, so this also, in a sense, um, has a dependency on unified properties. Um, all right. Yep. But beyond that, um, you know, the author team feels that it's baked as much as we can right now in the working group for us to issue working group last call. Yep, I think uh, I think the most uh, dependent part on the past uh, unified property would be the IANA registries. I think when that is finalized in the unified property, I think uh, the past vector document is mostly ready. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just taking some notes down. All right, great. Thanks. Um, if there's no questions, Thanks, then we can go to the rest of the talks, which are on non-chartered items, starting with uh, Danny's talk. So Danny, if you want to queue yourself up, I'll put your slides up in a second. So maybe can can I just give a very quick comment about working out unified properties and uh, pass vector and CDNI is a bunch of us uh, we are having weekly meetings. So I do want to advertise. I think we should post on the meeting. That given that you know CDNI unified property and pass vector coupled in such a way that I think early on we thought uh, essentially um, essentially extracting out the unified property as a module is very very helpful, but it turns out slow down things because essentially need to really become increase dependency. So I do want to say, if other people are interested and have expertise designing things and uh, can we join the meeting on every Wednesday, I believe is from. Uh, 9.30 to 10.30 US East Coast time, I think it'd be very helpful. And then we probably can move things very, things faster if we can get, uh, I think typically we have around like uh, around uh, eight to nine people per week, right? So if other people can join, I think it'd be really, really helpful with all the uh, uh, essentially co-authors and people with insights and, and interest in these three documents. Yeah, I think we need to really move these work pieces ahead. And if unified property is the common factor among all of them, and you guys discussed this in your Wednesday meetings, then for the rest of the folks on the working list, um, you know, please do participate because um, at least from the chair's perspective, um, we'd like to have the authors of unified property close down any open issues and move it ahead since we have at least two drafts right now, depending on it. Correct. I can second that. And um, one other thing, since we are lacking behind time, um, I would ask the authors that are presenting now to each maybe only use like 80% of the allocated time so that we can uh, make all the presentations happen. If possible. All right, Danny, the floor is yours. And as um, Jan said, please see if you can skip time, um, get us some time here and there. Yeah, I think Danny is muted, maybe. Danny? Danny? Looks like he's muted. Hey, Danny, I think you're muted. Okay, and in that case, I'll go ahead and um, go to uh, movie and Danny can maybe come back. So give me a second, let me load movie until then. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how about present the movie? Um, hold on, is this Danny or is this uh, author for movie? Author for movie. Okay, uh, let me load your slides then one second. All right, go for it. Sucks. I'm a lane transition. Yeah, next night.
Uh, there's a lot of uh, new application for the 5G area. Uh, for example, now in in the this coronavirus disease, we use a, a lot of cloud-based application like cloud office, cloud education for the students and the cloud meeting. Now we are using uh, this a 4K, 8K meeting, and the VRC are emerged. Um, next. Um, uh, uh, we all know this, for this application, good quality of experience is very important for our, uh, for the customer and for the user. And uh, one of the key points for uh, get good quality of experience is get the, the bit rates uh, or uh, uh, available benefit of a network. In such case, we need this application to get to know the network status and their benefits. Next. Um, but a lot of application now assume the network as a black box and the continuity uh, use the, uh, some private or special measurement to detect the network characteristics and then adaptively change the parameter, for example, the coding and the decoding, and also change the logic function. For example, sometimes they even close the video part to only support this, the voice part of the application. So this, this, this uh, mechanism has some drawbacks. It's not always precise and not every time is well, not a good uh, user experience. And uh, to solve this problem, uh, a lot of standard organization, for example, in 3PP standard, they defend 4G, 3G, 5G, they have proposed a lot of new, a lot of technology to help the application to, to provide this information to, to, to the application. For example, they use the, they defend a, uh, it is defined in IETF, but they also have been defined in the CPP to help the uh, MS application to dynamically change the bit rate. Also, the 5G, you can see in the, in the right side, they have the different network is a pulling function and the platform. Also, in the 4G system, the, the defined service capabilities is a pulling function and the platform. Also, they also have defined in the 5G, defined the QS notification control. It means that if something uh, for the QS cannot provide the uh, ground bit rate, they will notify the application and ask the application to some changes. Also in the 5G, they provide the, the alternative QS control. It means that if the current QS cannot uh, ensure they provide a downgrade QS parameter to the application, then the application can adapt the speed rate along with a ton of QS parameters. Also, the uh, 5G system are provide QS stem temperability to ask the support information to the application how long this QS parameter can sustain. After the time, they can change the uh, codec or the load function. Next. Slide. Um, so in, in our paper, we try to uh, use the movie uh, uh, take the information exposure to help the application to some uh, changes. Uh, we now based the, we do uh, we also do a lot of testing. We based on the five D real network in our labs. And uh, we use the cell level information, the user level information. Uh, we use the AI technology to to change this information to the network view. And uh, based on the network view, we take the some action to change the reading of interesting and uh, adapt the bit rate. In such case, we can provide a good quality and uh, uh, um, almost any network circumstance. 
We use the two technologies. One is the reading of existing, means that we uh, adapted the encoding on the, the user focused area based on the network bandwidth. Also, we use the cloud gaming in our company to invest in this side of reading of interest. We also use the adaptive bit rate as soon as it's widely used the technology in current uh, video and uh, game, gaming uh, application. We use the AI to learn the level, level of capability and the adaptively change the bit rate for the application. Uh, in such case, you follow the available uh, uh, network benefits. Next slide. Uh, we, uh, uh, for the reading of interesting, one of the uh, key point is to find out the full real reading of the, of the video attention. Then we are coding the interest in the reading with high bit rate. Then make the other area with the no bit rate. In such case, the whole bit rate of the video is reduced, but the QE is done not behind. So we can show, show on the, 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 the right side where uh, the figure will identify the reading of the character of the gaming and give more encoding to these characters. So we, in such case, we need to uh, detect the different uh, reading and uh, encoding, uh, select a different encoding, but this technology will introduce some uh, latency. We need, the, we need to adaptively change these schemes based on the network status. In such case, we provide good quality and then not introduce the, the, uh, the, the rebuffering. Next slide. We do uh, some experiment, uh, experiment with this network enclosure. We use the full uh, ROI installed in three different networks. The first one is the original video. The second uh, uh, case is the use very quick signal detection and coding with uh, just a 10 millisecond delay introduced. And the third case that we use more acute signal indication and high bit rate encoding. But in such cases, we were introduced 40 to 70 uh, delays. In the fourth cases, we use the um, our detection with the network information health. In such case, we use adaptive signal detection and encoding. So um, now you see these four uh, technologies in the three different uh, network. Once the network is with some low bit rate, and some high flux rate. The second is with with a network with high bit rates and then no flag rate. And uh, network three is uh, flag rate dramatically. Now we have some testing on the table in the right, uh, right side. So with this table, we find in the quarter four in, in, in the row four that we have the our addiction with network exposure can have very good uh, results. We can have a good balance between the detection delay and the detection accuracy. Next slide. I'm wondering if you can start wrapping it up, if you can get a couple minutes or so from um, from the slides, from, from the talks that'll help us finish on time. So I, 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 I think a, a lot of people will know this technology is widely used in Dash. Also, we use AI technology to, to change the bit rate, 
Tääni pakatsi. Next. Next. Um, in this adaptive build retent, we use the uh, uh, information for the user for the user level and the cell level. We also use some text in here that uh, we only use the MCS and PRB and can can, pro can provide a good results. Next, uh, Martin, uh, go ahead from the queue. I was happy to go to wait to the end. Okay. okay. Uh, we we propose that a uh, uh, movie architecture for the network application, uh, a web application. In this, uh, we will use this in this uh, network application in the server side because in current times, in the 3PP site, the, the network, the wireless network only provide the information to the server side. Now they are not efficiently to provide this information to the client side. Next. Okay, so um, if you can wrap it up in a minute, that would be awesome. Okay. So we propose that uh, you can the at all uh, in the in, 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 with the movie next. And uh, we need to also need something. We need to how to select the network information, and how to bind this information with the path of the communication, and how to uh, to do the network coding to support SSE and, and uh, based on the JSON, and how to support the scalability and reliability. I think that's all. Um, Martin, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks for submitting this draft. Um, I, I, it's interesting work, and I actually learned a lot about a lot of things. Uh, that said, um, I, I feel like it's a little, um, the draft is a little focused, and the presentation is a little bit overemphasizing the application and what it does with the data um, for what Alto is interested in, which is what data do you need. Um, and I am curious if, rather than getting into the weeds of what the exact modulation schemes are and so on, if you can just use a lot of the, the tools that we're already building in Alto, like min-max bandwidth uh, to, to allow the application to, to, to um, make its decisions. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of real-time updates to network parameters going out to the server. It seems like a lot of load in an Alto server and it seems like we have more latency than just direct measurement, which is something you dismissed in your first slide. So it's a bunch of different questions there. One is min-max using the existing parameters. The second one is how much uh, how much change is there really? That you, or how, how, how dynamic do you need these, these reports to be? Okay. <clears throat> I, I think that uh, this movie is, uh, uh, extension to Alto is some different, is some different uh, with the uh, traditional Alto work. Traditional Alto work uh, is just to uh, select uh, uh, endpoint to communicate, to save the uh, transport uh, resources. So it's like a selecting the path. But in our uh, paper, we want to say that after path is selected. We also need to get, get the information on the path and help the application to do the communication. So, so traditional auto is to select the path to, to provide good quality of service. But our move is that after you select a path, you also need to dynamically monitor the path to provide the quality of the uh, experience. Is the big difference. Uh, the second is, uh, as you say that yes, um, this uh, network information exposure may be provide some uh, traffic have uh, have uh, traffic additional tra traffic to the server. Um, 
of our sun is well dependent how such a network function wanted you want to collect your network different the uh, network information you collect it from the network okay um i see there's two questions from ingbar and richard i'm you know really thinking we need to close close the line here um or after martin what i i think what the best thing to do to move expeditiously and fairly is to probably um, Ingmar and Richard, do you have comments or, or questions that need answers? I have a question that I would like to get an answer to. Richard? I, I do want to give a very quick comment and uh, about so the... Let's, uh, so let me, let's do this. Um, Richard, please uh, provide your comment. And Ingmar, because this is non-chartered work right now, Let's continue going to the other other um, presentation, and maybe if you could kindly post on the list, um, that that might be the most expeditious way to go about this. Okay, thank you, Richard. Go ahead while I load the while I load Danny's talk. Sure. So, um, Martin, very quick comment. I think your question was uh, using minimum bandwidth and maximum bandwidth, uh, bandwidth, and uh, all the other things. Is it really good enough or not? And I think that's an excellent question uh, to the authors. I, be, I remember reading from their draft, they are talking about the parameters, for example, what's the current load, basically, for example, what's the current number of concurrent users in the current cell, cell phone tower, which clearly is not in the anything like we consider as perform metrics, but it's more like a load level on the on a station. So um, that's a quick comment. And I think then I think, Martin, you asked question would be then what's the implication and real time and so on. I think probably implication for them, what I read, uh, of course, I try to need to crack me would be you probably need a very flexible way to export export all kinds of port metrics. The current auto way of defining a lot of metrics probably becomes slightly not scalable. And of course, if you talk about pushing information, I remember you're pushing information every 30 seconds or even shorter, right? And uh, then it definitely will have scalability issue. And uh, so definitely in terms of impact on auto would be okay. Uh, how do we really make the information to be compact? Is really even possible to push information at a level? Of, you mentioned SSE, uh, but possible to really push information like uh, at very, very quick, for example, probably. I, we don't have experiment. I think actually probably Ingmar probably have much more real life experience, which I will talk about. And can we really push information at a level of, um, let's see, millis uh, 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds and one second and what's the, what world bound really is? <laughs> probably wouldn't need a lot of work. Just I'm trying to even take the comments um, by Martin to really re reflect it. And then... Okay. All right, thanks. So clearly to the authors, there seems to be enough interest. Um, if you want to continue um, um, finessing around the edges on the working group list, um, that's that's fair game. Um, our intent right now is at least, at least till the Madrid ITF to finish the three open drafts. Um, so please continue discussion on the list. And Danny, please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Finally. Okay. I will try to summarize my, my presentation. Next, please. If you can get us a few minutes, um, please, please do so. See. See. Next, please. So for multi-domain supporting, uh, for alto supporting multi-domain use cases, we need to solve the, the following key questions. What information the multi-domain application needs? What are the issues of gathering that information and how to design a, a whole framework? So basically this presentation will provide some insights to answer questions. Next, please. So le let's start with a motivating use case example. Next, please. So here Sebastian, we have the, uh, uh, Sebastian, do you have a question on Danny's comment or previous one? No, actually, on the current presentation, um, uh, for, for the previous slide, I would add to the question, uh, what is the definition of multi-domain? Yeah. Because uh, yeah, even uh, the original use case of optimizing BitTorrent in the access networks of Comcast and AT&T oh. was, so to say, multi-domain. Yeah. Uh, so I'm missing that from the clarify, draft yeah. as well. Yeah. Let me try to clarify that. And in our case, the... It, Please, could you go back to the second slide, please? So for this multi-domain approach, uh, 
basically multi domain involves multiple networks managed by different administrative domains as I, I as mentioned in the the last uh, yeah, but the last part podcast of and at and are also different administrative environments when we optimized BitTorrent using a tracker from Pirate Bay or, or whatnot. So even then we had like multiple domains. So what's new here? No, uh, yeah, the, the idea is to go more beyond to Alto to support multi-domain approach because the current Alto design is going to provide information in a single domain environment, you know? So perhaps um, we let Danny go ahead and maybe okay. that distinction yeah. will become clear as he talks about it. Okay. So for example, here we have a, a collaborative network composite of three member domain, an application web to reserve bandwidth, for example, for two flows. And before the application made resource allocation decision to execute to execute the flows, uh, two questions. First one, the first one, what is the end-to-end -end cost across multiple domains, for example? The cost in terms of, for example, resource availability and sharing. And the second one is the application need to find the sequence of domain and candidate bytes. Okay. Uh, next, please. We can skip this slide. Okay, now uh, we identify a, a very simple information that the application need. Now we we uh, we need to identify key issues in the current Alto design of core or for gathering multi-domain network information. For example, in multi-domain scenarios, uh, it's not possible to optimize the traffic with only local available information. Uh, that is, the server to client Alto communication is not enough. Uh, so. Uh, an alto or an multi-domain alto server communication is necessary to to allow the changing network information from multiple domains. Next, please. Um, Ingmar has a question. Ingmar, please okay. go ahead. I can I can wait until the end to finish the presentation. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, in order to to find available network resources between different source and destination pair, Alto need to discover which domain are involved for the different traffic flows, and also need to discover a set of candidate paths to know how to reach the a remote destination, for example. Next, please. Once the multi-domain connectivity discovery is performed, an application also needs to be aware about the location of different Alto servers. So. Uh, in multi-domain scenarios, Alto server will be located in different network domains. So, uh, multi-domain Alto server discovery mechanisms are, are also necessary. Next, please. Uh, another challenge for exposing multi-domain network information is that each domain uh, may have its own representation of the same network. For example, suppose that the past cost for domain B is utilization shares instead of uh, available bandwidth. So in this case, both properties are not comparable together. Or even if all the mine have the same utilization chair property, not necessarily they have the same form of billing because each domain is autonomous. Domain A may share in dollar, domain B in euros, etc. Next, please. Application also needs a query to express all common resource requirement to the network. Uh, for example, for a, a, a specific flow, uh, may can provide a set of applications requirements such as reachability, bidirectional symmetry, quality of service metrics, and so on. So the current Alto uh, is, uh, provides on a very simple Alto resource query, such as the filtered network map, filtered code map. However, a more flexible query language is necessary. Next, please. Uh, th there are other uh, issues related to the scalability, to solving the the optimization problems uh, specified by the application requirement that could be expensive, uptime consuming, or rela related to the privacy, because new alt extension uh, require fine grained uh, information. So alt extension could raise new security and privacy concerns. Next, please. Finally, we have some mechanisms to that could be considered when designing a multi-domain alto framework. Uh, next, please. For example, Alto requires not only server to client communication, but also communication from different Alto servers. Uh, could, could be considered a hierarchical or mesh deployment with a central Alto server or multiple independent servers gathering information from other connected domains. Next, please. 
multi-domain mechanism combining domain sequence computation or path computation need to be uh, also defined né? or uh, or standardized protocols computation protocol may be considering as well BGP based on BGP BGPLS on others uh, based on the PCE architecture next please uh, for the multi-domain uh, so if you can yeah. wrap it up in the next yeah. uh, minute, that'll be awesome. Then we have a question yeah. from Ingmar. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the same for the multi-domain alto service discovery. There is a, even a recently alto RFC for cross domain service discovery, but other mechanisms, basically PC, PCE or BGP could be also considered. Next, please. The same for a uh, multi-domain composition is necessary in order to to get all the network information from different Alto servers to a single and virtual uh, domain abstraction. And also we have a flexible lang uh, query language to, to Alto uh, are able to, to filter a large number of qualified domains. Next, please. Others are related to the scalability. Né? We need to mechanism for, for for to improve the scalability and performance, so we need to mechanisms to provide accurate network information and at the same time for protect the each member domain. Uh, next, that's it. Uh, next, play, we will continue our discussion about the, the extensions to address the key issues or the deployment concept of Halto for multi-domain. That's All right. it. Thanks uh, for finishing a couple minutes early. So, Ingmar, <laughs> you go ahead and um, ask your question. And Sebastian, if your question was not answered, maybe you can come back and see. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I I don't really want to ask a question so much as to make you aware of the fact that we are already working on this. So we have multiple networks that have neighboring Alto servers. Currently, we're not exchanging information through Alto between them, um, but we are in the process of setting this up and actually building that system. So if you want to get some um, more deeper insights or you want to uh, just discuss on how this works in technical terms and what we've already done, um, we're open for uh, for discussion and for question regarding that. And that's when I say oh. we, I mean the account here in the meeting. Okay, Good. Thank so, you so um, much. You'll be going after the next presentation. So, um, Sebastian, uh, really quick, please go ahead. Uh, so that's really interesting work. I think a subset of what you are trying to solve has already been addressed in RFC 8686. So the what we call cross-domain server discovery aims at parts of what you are trying to do. Um, so just saying I'm interested in maybe discussing what's the gap to what you are trying to achieve and uh, what's missing in between. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Um, so again, um, it, you know, some interest from the working group. So continue um, squirreling around the edges of the draft um, as we get towards Madrid. And, um, you know, that said, um, Jensen, you want to come back for BGPLS? Yeah, sure. Uh, how many minutes I have? And again, if you can finish up a couple minutes early, that'll be awesome. Yeah, so we only have um, 16, 17 minutes time left in four presentations. So maybe try to make it really quick. Okay, sure. I think it'll be very quick and uh... So that's a, so far that's a work uh, about uh, we're trying to leverage the BGPLS to, to provide deploy the auto services and uh, then consider the auto services consider some basic auto uh, map services like the network map and the cost map and uh, all of them need some network information and auto had to convert this information to the uh, auto map. Uh, services and uh, the resources provided to the application. And uh, so for the network map, we need the topology information and uh, it includes the interdomain topology and the intradomain topology and uh, also the CIDR distributions. So you can recover this information from the topology information and uh, the cost map. So you need the routing information and the uh, performance metrics information so, so that you can get the intern routes and the routing cost. And uh, I think uh, I consider about the BGPRS because it's a potential approach to have uh, to have all of this information to pull. So I'll discuss how to do it and uh, next slide. 
So the, the BTPI actually allows a BTP sticker to advertise a link state database on the traffic engineering database, how it's connected at GP area. And uh, we can see the benefit is that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of the, the unified interface to advertise the IGP topology routing information in the IGP domain and the additional performance metrics. And uh, it will use the existing BGP session. So uh, you want to, uh, if you're trying to collect all this uh, data source, so you don't have to establish the extra connections. But the limitation that uh, the only one hop data can be, uh, can be done by the PPRS. So you cannot, uh, so the BTPRS advertisement cannot be propagated to the remote routing servers. And so next page. So if you're trying to uh, make the auto start talking about the, talk to the every single BTP routers, uh, I think it's very efficient. So uh, we have some efficiency requirements on deployment auto using the BTPRS. So Consider the other server should only communicate with the necessary BGP speakers, and uh, uh, the other server should only enable the BGP RS advertisement on the necessary BGP sessions between the BGP speakers. So we have some uh, minim minimization, so minimal um, uh, consideration. So next page. So this page issue, we're trying to use the BTPRS to collect the IGP to uh, information. So I consider how to do that to minimize the uh, connections to the BTP speakers. So we select, we know stack the minimal set of the AS's as anchors and uh, make sure that the each AS uh, can establish a BTPRS session with at least one anchor. So we found these anchors, and uh, then we may say auto server. Uh, the each anchor mirror is uh, received the BTPRS advertisement to the to the auto server, so so that the auto server can cover the, all the IGP information from the whole network, uh, from the every IGP domains, and uh, because in the settings we assume the the interdomain. Uh, the bridge is uh, uh, relatively stable because, because they, because we assume the, the, the all the assets come from the single ASP, so we can control all the, the all the assets and uh, we know the, how to what's the pairing configuration between the assets. So the next page it's uh, about uh, some consideration about the routing information collection and. Uh, one observation is that we think that the route from the downstream AS can be inferred by the route from the upstream AS. So, so the idea is that we set the minimal set of the AS as the anchors, and uh, so we still try to find the minimal set of the anchors and uh, make sure that the each AS is provider of the remote provider of at least one anchors, so that uh, then we we, use, uh, we make the each anchor maybe it's a BGP read with the auto servers and uh, then the auto server can oh, only fetch the routing information from the minimal set of the anchors, but it can infer the, uh, the routing information. So it's necessary to the to compute the cost map. So next page. This is just a, a quick customer is about the, the BTPRS can be used to provide the necessary information, but uh, when trying to consider so how to collect the necessary information by minimal BTP sessions, so uh, get, get the process more efficient. Okay, um, thanks. I have a question. So, Ingmar, um, why don't you go ahead and ask a question while I load your slides, because you'll be going next. Okay, um, actually, Hans will be presenting. I'm just here to annoy people with questions. So, um, have you thought about the, all the considerations of these different implementations that um, especially IGP brings when you're trying to calculate cost maps? And just having the um, cost map 
uh, calculated based on a topology does not actually tell you anything about flows or how flows are going to be mapped. Hans is going to touch on that in the next one. Um, long story short, we have been dealing with this problem for about three to five years now, and there is a whole lot of can of worms that you're going to open with this one. Um, if you want to discuss this in more detail, again, I can only offer that we um, that we reach out. Uh, that, that you reach out. Uh, we're very open to discussing this, but there is a whole lot of stuff when you're trying to integrate IGP and especially traffic mapping flows, uh, mapping traffic flows that you're probably not aware of yet. Actually, so far we only consider the, uh, the OSPF and the, the SS in the IGP, but uh, there are uh, some yeah, you, you, in, in the end, what you need to do is map traffic, not topology, and mapping traffic to topology is going to be hard. So I think we need to take this on the list. I think this is interesting sure. because um, Jensen's talk and uh, your talk are essentially now trying to skirt, you know, trying to figure out how to create these map automatically. Um, oh, we're already doing that. Yeah, and I, I know people are doing that, but to what extent they are, you know, the efficacy of those, the problems of those. Um, so um, that said, um, it's 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 interesting from the evolution of Alto um, where things are, are are trying to head out now. Um, before it used to be that the service provider would create these maps, and now there's strats looking into how to create these maps. About maybe five six years ago, I did some work in using the broadband information um, across the US that was being captured by FCC to create maps. So this is, um, and that's published as a paper as well. I can put the information out. Um, so that said, um, Hans, please continue. And again, if okay. you could get us a couple of minutes, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I try my very best. But can you hear me? Oh. There's lots of jitters, but maybe it'll cure itself as you talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, yeah, let's start. Uh, I tried my very best to be as quick as possible and probably shorten a few slides. Next slide, please. So yeah, the problem is that why we actually do automatic generation is probably well aware. So we have a big complexity, especially in the network we are connected to. We have thousands of routers. But I think it's not, so this is probably a really, really um, a large scale network. So it also is a problem with smaller networks with probably tens or hundreds of routers as well. Then we have a diversity of um, yeah, customers which actually take or consume these maps. They are different mapping engines. They have different requirements regarding what to optimize. There are different capabilities, actually how they can consume data and what detail level. And the last part of automating network maps and cost maps is basically the actuality. If you automate things, you can be very fast or much faster than doing it in, in another way. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, we basically fully automate or automate the processing or pre-processing and pre-generation of network and cost maps. Uh, for networks, of course, we need ciders uh, for the to know yeah for the individual pits, and of course, a grouping cr a criteria, some sort of rule set how to put those pits together. And for the cost map, we need some sort of affinity, affinity criteria, basically, which means how to get from one pit to any, to the other. It's symmetric, and and actually, the data set the metric runs on. So basically, what do we need for all to calculate and process and automate and generate all this is data, a lot of data. Next slide, please. I think that does not scale very well. Um, so yeah, the first thing is that we need um, yeah, some sort of the network. So we need the ciders and we need the topologies. The topology, not the topologies, there are situations I can have several, but it's not up in the scope. Um, yeah, two sources are already mentioned before. It's IGP for, for some sort of ciders and topology and BGP, especially for internal and also external ciders, which are not from within the network, but from other networks. 
And yeah, also for topology, the previous call was mentioned the BGPLS, where we can, can also or might also be able to obtain topology information from. Um, so the problem here is that the data from run route uh, might not be enough, especially if you have multiple peering points, for example, you need the information from at least every peering router. Better is if you get the routing tables from all routers to know how to send data to which destination in this network. Next slide, please. So um, now we have topology inside us and we can start it. Now, yeah, unfortunately not. The problem here is we only see our own network. So everything what happens outside of our network is out of our view. Um, and yeah, from an ISP perspective, of course, the most traffic comes from our network. It's video streaming, it's gaming, it's, it's, it's downloads. Um, the problem here is that routing protocol only tells us the forward path. So we know where where the traffic flows to, but we cannot actually tell where the source is, uh, where the traffic stream from the source is entering our network, meaning the entry point cannot be derived from the routing protocol, and that is a crucial part. You cannot tell from the routing protocol where it actually comes from. You need some other mechanism to tell that. If the traffic is not, if you don't have full control of all the, the aspects. So if the traffic comes from outside of your network, you cannot tell for sure where it's actually entering your network. Next slide, please. This is uh, where we um, use ingress point detection. So ingress point is basically the point where a traffic flow enters your network. So it's a router and a few more specific interface on this router where data flows from one source to one destination or to all destinations in your, enter your network. Uh, how we do this? So we process actually flow information gathered, for example, via NetFlow or S4 protocol. We collect this information from all border routers of the network. So we have, we can actually see all the traffic that enters the network from the outside. And we're also monitoring some internal routers as well to see traffic flows inside of the network. And then we statistically evaluate those information. And with the statistical uh, evaluation, we find uh, the site, for example, the source, and uh, the route and the interface where it's entering our network. So here we have a, a small example where there's on the right side, it's on my screen, it's pretty small. We have four different streams. Um, we have, uh, the blue, the red and the, the green screen are basically from one destination to, uh, from one source to one destination. And then we have two yellow screens, which are basically coming from the same source IP, but depending on the destination, entering the network on different uh, yeah, routers and interfaces. So they have, for the same source IP, you can have different ingress points depending on the destination. This is why you theoretically need to do a destination split on your evaluation as well. Uh, practically, I can say we haven't observed such behavior. So usually, all the flows from one source entering the network in the same yeah ingress point. And um, yeah, in general, because of the large data, especially you need to process to to collect this information and to get to those ingress points, this is a very heavy operation. So we are speaking of gigabits of data every second, just the flow records. Next slide, please. Another way to measure in this point is actually active measurement, which cannot be performed from cannot be performed from inside the network, but must be performed from the content provider. The basic way to do this is, for example, using a trace route and just detect the first net uh, the first router you see within the target network. Uh, this is detectable, for example, via the IP if it's basically from the address space of the, the ISP, for example, or the host name. It is possible to, to provide this information before and it makes it easier. If you have a private peering, you also can just take the counterpart of your own border router. But then I you need a uh, channel to get this. If you could wrap it up now, we're getting close to the top of yeah. the hour. Yeah, this is the last crucial part, actually. So after that, I can run pretty fast. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then you need to peer point. And then you just need a channel into the IP server. Sorry, I have a large feedback. Okay, and then you need to channel into the ultra server. And this is basically when we compiled the slide, we had the idea, why not integrate such information into ultra map request? Next slide, please. 
Um, our basic idea was just to integrate information in network or cost map requests. I know this is a GET request at the moment, so we might need to change it to POST request to insert data. And also from our side, it is not, so we cannot pre-calculate those information anymore and need to be, if we ever want to do this, more cost efficient. So uh, because to speed this up, this is, if this is something somebody thinks is worth pursuing or has an idea where it can be integrated in something existent, I'm happily discuss this with anybody who's interested in. Next slide. So uh, yeah, we need some additional data in the end, so we can skip that one. If you want to have more details on it, feel free to ask me. And uh, yeah, that's, I don't need to describe the summary. Basically, the points are there, and that's it. All right. Um, I know we are at 9 o'clock right now. Um, we have two more slides, uh, two more talks to go. Jan, do you want to maybe um, extend for five minutes and, and have them present their ideas quickly? Okay, so those of you that want to leave, please do, but we'll go about maybe five minutes over. Um, Richard, you have a quick question? Sure. Yeah, and while you're loading my slide, I believe I'm next one. Uh, uh, basically, a quick, quick reply to uh, Hans' question about this on-demand measurement. And, and absolutely, there's very strong interest, we're not from my side. Uh, work I have been very, by the way, number one is really, really impressive work. And number two, answer your question is, uh, there's a lot of their interest, and you, you post a question about on-demand generation map, and, and a key person actually is Lyle Birds, B-E-R-T-Z, L-Y-L-E, and Lyle, and, Lyle and, his okay. and he has very, I believe I heard, of, I heard from him a couple of times, he said, okay, the only way eventually to handle these issues is to on-demand and using this uh, like request to trigger the measurement. I don't believe he's online here either. I think Farney also from Sprint, She's not here. I believe there's a conflict, and but the short answer is there's a very strong interest about this. I think that's really, really. Uh, I think that's a very interesting direction that which, uh, which is a good direction for pursue. Perfect. So if we can set something up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can again, guess. interest in the work. Um, please go ahead and um, on the list, and we we will figure out um, how things are moving by by Madrid ITF. Richard, please. Go ahead. Okay, and I'll try to finish as soon as possible. So I'll talk about incremental update using HTTP2. Next slide, please. And basically is, uh, I'll very quickly give an overview of SSE, which is the essential server push, and then why we talk about HTTP2, because actually really the, the motivation came from the IESG review. Next slide, please. So uh, auto SSE turns out to be relatively useful too, and provides three goals, uh, functions, push updates, instead of pull and push. Number two is when you do the push, I don't send the whole information, do a compact incremental encoding. Number three is if you want, you want to uh, put, put inform, uh, push information, you should give a client to tell, to tell you what information you are really interested. So therefore you should do dynamic stream control. And the current auto SSC essentially is the design using two services. One is update service, you get all the update messages. And then the second one is stream control, and which is essentially um, you specify what you're interested in. So that's architecture. Next slide, please. The why the SS design as it is, is because it is HTTP 1.x compatible design. And in that, with that essential architecture, two services. And what's the issue number one? And is a lot of dynamic addition and removal of resources. Basically, we call SS the cost of substreams to receive uh, data updates. And, but HTTP 1.x would allow sending only one request at a time. And uh, so therefore, if you send a request <coughs> over there, and for example, look at the client, look at the bottom page, and the client send a request, okay, I'm interested in this update. And later, if you want to change and the set, and <clears throat> you cannot send in a request anymore from the same connection. So therefore, you have really started a different connection. That's why it introduced a concept called stream control server, and stream control server will get a request and then through a private channel and gives to the uh, update server and this update server will send the additional or stop of the updates. That's why I end up with the architecture. Next slide, please. The second issue why I end up with this architecture is you need to multiplex multiple logical data streams. And because why, and when the client and connects to the server, and then you essentially have a control update, tells you which stream stopped and running, and also data updates for different resources. For example, I subscribe to, the client subscribes to see uh, three network maps, and you need to push all three network maps. So therefore, essentially, there are a lot of lo logical data streams. And they have different media types, and some with full encoding, some with different incremental encoding, and so on. 
So essentially, it turns out to be complex. So how do we really do this multiplexing? And for HTTP 1.x design, and the design was using SSE. And essentially, it exists uh, uh, HTML5 design. Basically, is you send SSE events, and each event would have the media type and data ID. Media type essentially really tells you what really the type is. You can use, for example, uh, you can, can have a control update, and you can also have data update. And essentially, media type tells you what the encoding is. And then you have data ID essentially to do multiplexing to tell what really is what multiplexing is. And then, of course, you send all the data around. Next slide, please. So really quick, um, if you can wrap it up and okay. I'll, I'll get to the issue, what, what's the issue here? Right. So basically here, so the really is, is single serialization and intra stream and inter substream. You serialize it into everything into single update stream. Next slide, please. The main issue, the next slide. Okay. The next slide really is, and basically is, uh, we can actually do better using HTTP2 if, oh, go back one slide, please. And uh, the, yeah, basically really is, I think the push from ICIG is, if we have HTTP2, do we end up with the same design? Can you really gain from benefit of HTTP2? And it turns out HTTP2 can give two benefits, multiple benefits. Number one is multiplexing. And that is essentially using single uh, serialization of all the streams. So therefore, you serialize, you do your own multiplexing, but you still end up with only one data. So therefore, you still can have a, a single head of, of, line, uh, of line blocking. And uh, HTTP essentially allow you concurrent updates. And second one, HTTP will allow bi-direction. So therefore, you don't really end up with two connections. You might be able to do only one. And of course, more efficiencies, higher compressions, flexible controls, priorities of bandwidth allocation, and so on. Next slide, please. So basically, here's a initial design, which I don't need to go to the details. And essentially is we want to potentially leverage HTTP2 design to do multiplexing and have single design and to do uh, essentially take advantage of, of HTTP2 to give better performance and a simpler structure. Next slide, please. So basically, initial draft, we have draft, which I have not uploaded yet. And feedback on the design, we'll probably give it a timing. I probably just post on the, uh, uh, I guess, the mailing list. And then, of course, really a question to the group is also would it be right now, of course, ITF also evolving from two to three and so on. And do we target two or really continue essentially chasing the newer transport layer? And for example, three or not. So I, I will post those questions online. Great. Thank you. I think uh, a lot of this introspection came from, I, I believe, one of the AD reviews or so. Um, but again, um, let's take this onto the line um, online. Um, this brings us to our last talk, um, which probably keep it to a two and a half, three minutes, please. Um, FDN, I don't have any slides for this. Oh, this uh, is coming in from uh, FDN side. Uh, sorry for uh, didn't uh, upload the slides. So can I share my screen or I just uh, talk? Um, you can share your screen, but uh, please do it uh, really fast. I'm trying to find you. Uh, okay. Could you tell me your name so I can give you the ball? Uh, this is Zhong Xing. Z H. Z H O N G. X I N G. Z H O N G. X I N G. Okay, somebody is displaying, so please go ahead. Um, two minutes. Okay, function delivery network. It is uh, uh, our concept of uh, delivering functions to the edge of the network, similar to the uh, CDN, that is, uh, which is uh, used to deliver contents. We are using FDN to deliver uh, functions to the uh, edge of the network. The architecture is like this. I will go through it really quickly. So we are using a a controller based mechanism to deliver functions to the edge of the network. And by functions, we mean the some uh, operational calls or some business logic or even application, uh, some, uh, some application modules. Because the time is really limited, uh, we will skip the technical details. But the uh, uh, function delivery network is a uh, deploying with the uh, uh, China mobiles and uh, China telecommunications uh, network in China. And uh, the, uh, currently, it is operational in 
uh, several provinces of China, and we are uh, integrating the idea of auto uh, with FDN to uh, uh, make the function delivery in the edge computing area more efficient and more uh, applicable. And the uh, uh, for the implementation of the FDN, we used uh, IBM OpenVisc and also uh, Kubernetes to uh, disseminate the uh, dockers and containers and to uh, make to optimize the network traffic uh, in the uh, uh, system. One minute. Uh, okay, so that concludes my slide. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> really short. <laughs> yeah, Do you want to give closing comments? Uh, yes, I, I can. So um, thank you everybody for participating. I think this uh, was actually um, not a bad uh, group. 25 people, I think, participated. So thank you and thank you for all the presentations. Um, I can remain, I, so basically it remains what I said in the beginning, and we want to finish the milestones first, and um, we, we, I think we're on a good path, but I think today's presentation showed that we are still, there's still some work to do, and I'm happy to hear that Richard uh, reported that there's going to be weekly meetings to progress this. We, Jay and I would like to have this done by summer, whatever the summer meeting is. I guess it's going to be a virtual ITF meeting again. Um, uh, at least personally, I cannot imagine a meeting happening in Madrid in July or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, so we want to uh, close the uh, milestones by then. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody. And um, we continue on the mailing list. I mean, all the questions we had and um, all the progress of the documents, of course, we want to continue on the mailing list. Great. For those of you that haven't signed the blue sheet, please do. The link is on the chat. Um, I'll I'll stop the recording, but we'll be on to let people sign the blue sheets. And um, see you in Madrid in some form, virtual or physical. Correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.